Keith, you can turn this one down. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, 12 and 13. Thank you. And I hole punch these just in case you want to, you know, find a binder and just keep them all uh, together. I think it'll be a helpful little study for you once it's all said and done. Okay, Hebrews chapter 4. This is our theme verse for the year. Why don't we say it together this morning? Hebrews 4.12. Ready? Begin. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And then I'll uh, read verse 13, says, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. So the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. The sword. Uh, look at uh, Ephesians chapter 6. This uh, symbol or this picture of the word of God carries through. Ephesians chapter 6 talking about the uh, armor of God. Ephesians 6.17 says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So we're going to talk about sword trading this morning. Why don't we open up in a word of prayer? Father, thank you for this uh, chance to come together. We thank you for the beautiful morning that we have today and the beautiful frost on the trees and the, uh, everywhere we look, Lord. And uh, Lord, we just uh, we honor and worship you for your uh, creative abilities and how, uh, Lord, you value beauty and that you have put beauty into this world. And I'm so thankful for that. Lord, we ask even now that you would help us as we learn to study about your word and how to handle your word properly. I pray that you'd make us effective students of the word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, the Bible tells us that we are in a spiritual battle. That's your first blank there if you want to follow along and keep notes. We are in a spiritual battle. If you back up to verse 10 there in Ephesians 6, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. And so God has equipped us with all of the armor that we need to stand against the attacks of the devil. And so, you know, you go through and you read about the parts, pieces of the armor. And we're going to get to that in not too long uh, as we go through Ephesians. But just glance, take a glance at them here and look at the different pieces of armor that there are. Verse 14, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. So it's like a, a belt, uh, something that girdles everything together. Uh, having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith he shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation. Now all of those, shield, breastplate, helmet, they're all defensive, aren't they? And that's the next blank there. They, these are all defenses, defensive pieces of armor because the devil is attacking us. We, our job, by the way, is not to go uh, beat up on the devil, but to withstand the attacks of the devil. He says, just, have, just do everything you can to stand, to withstand the attacks. And so he, God gives us these defensive pieces of armor, and we'll get into those, but that's for another day. There's only one offensive weapon, and that's mentioned at the end of verse 17, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We have one weapon of offense, and it, and it is the Word of God. This is our tool. This is our weapon 
whereby we can not only withstand the attacks of the devil, but we can, we can charge, I mean, we can move forward, and we can defeat those temptations and so on that are going to come. You know, the, you think about like a soldier that's sent into battle. Um, he has to be trained, doesn't he? He has to be trained to become skillful in his use of his weapon. You know, I was talking with Harley this week, and, and he's a little bummed because in, in the little window of time that he has before he gets deployed, they're throwing all these extra trainings at him, you know, and he's going to be gone a lot more than he thought he was going to be. And, and I thought, got to thinking about this, that, boy, they, they want to make sure when they get to the battlefield, they're trained, that they are ready. And, you know, they, they give these guys their guns, and, and they, I don't know if they still do this, but have to, like, blindfolded, be able to take that thing apart and put it back together. They know that weapon inside and out. They can do it in a certain period of time. That way, if the gun jams up and they're on the front lines, they pull that thing apart, they pull out whatever's jammed up, they put it back together, and they're back in the, back in the battle. They have to know their weapon. If you just take some guy off the street who's never handled a firearm before and you give him a machine gun and say, all right, go into battle, he's going to kill himself or somebody and he's not going to be very effective in battle at all. Uh, have you ever handled a, a real sword before? Like a, like a real heavy sword, all right? You, you watch them on the movies and stuff, they make it look really easy, don't they? And, and it's not easy. They're, they're heavy pieces of equipment. And again, if you're not careful, Boy, you, you start swinging that thing around, you chop yourself, you chop the guy next to you. It's, it's a dangerous situation. So to get ready for battle, they would train. And, and you've probably seen this as well in movies and so on, where they've got wooden swords or whatever, and they're in the camp, and they're, they're, they're duking it out, and they're fighting, and they're learning the right moves and so on. And then, once they're ready for it, they put a real sword in their hand, so they're not going to hurt somebody. But the point is, they have to be trained, they have to become skilled, in their use of the weapon. Uh, turn with me to a couple of passages of Scripture here. Judges chapter 8. Judges chapter 8. Verse 20. And he said unto Jether, his firstborn. So this is Gideon. Gideon and the famous battle of Gideon and so on. Uh, and he takes these princes captives. And he said unto Jether, his firstborn, up and slay them. But the youth drew not his sword, for he feared because he was yet a youth. So he's a young man, probably a teenager. And Gideon is the leader. And Gideon says, kill him. I'm handing you this victory, son. I want you to learn how to how to be a, how to be effective in battle. And yet the the boy was too scared to pull out his sword to thrust it through somebody because he wasn't trained. He wasn't equipped. He he didn't feel confident in doing that. And that's maybe another story for another day. But the point is, those who aren't comfortable with their weapon won't be confident in battle. Look at First Samuel 17. Go forward just. Another book or so. First Samuel 17 and verse 38. So this is the story of David and Goliath, and David shows up, says, I'll go. I'll, I'll go take on this giant. Verse 38, and Saul armed David with his armor. And he put an helmet of brass upon his head, and also he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. So he's loaded down with all this armor. You can imagine Saul's this huge guy, you know. And David is this kind of the runt of the litter. And so can you imagine the, the armor just kind of dragging on him? And he's slopping around in this coat of mail and everything, and this huge sword. And David's like, I can't even move. I, I, I don't know how to handle all this. I haven't trained with these. I'm not comfortable with these, this weaponry. And so he takes it all off, and that's where he just grabs his sling. He grabs a weapon that he was comfortable using so that, so that he could go out and be effective in battle. 
turn all the way forward to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. It's kind of a convicting verse here. He says, For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful, in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And so unfortunately he's saying here, there's, some, there's a lot of Christians who've been saved for a length of time, but they're still unskillful in the word. They're not trained in how to use the sword properly. Now, the, the, the ability to use the Bible skillfully, it's not only an expectation for pastors, there in your notes, for pastors, but for every Christian. So yes, you would expect me to know the Bible fairly well. If I didn't know the Bible and I struggled, you know, like, oh, you know, I, I don't know where that book of the Bible is, or I, I, I'm not comfortable uh, talking to somebody about salvation, you'd be like, you're a pastor, you need to know how to do this stuff, right? Well, it's not just an expectation for pastors. According to Paul here, any Christian who's been saved a length of time ought to be capable of taking the word of God and confidently teaching it to somebody else. And he kind of chides them here. He says, no, you're, you're like little children in the word of God. You, you need me to teach you again. And, and so he's um, saying that it, it ought to be that we are skillful in the word of God for ourselves. And that's why we need training. And I call it the sword training because it's a weapon. It is the sword of the spirit. But it's really, we're talking about in this series, learning how to handle the Bible for yourself. And we're going to talk about, um, well, look at some of the goals for this study. I want you to be encouraged to consistently read the Bible on your own. That's kind of just baseline stuff. Just be in it and don't be discouraged by it. To learn how to read it properly and, and even when you don't understand it all, how to give you some, some techniques of how to pick up the stuff that's lying on the surface and apply it to your life and some techniques in your devotional life uh, to use there. Um, you also uh, should be able to study the Bible for yourself. So to take that next step beyond just reading to studying it to mining out a truth or, you know, th this word, what does this word mean, and begin to really dig and to get beyond just milk in a bottle and learn how to chew some meat, okay? That's what we're talking about. That's what study enables you to do is to get into some of the thicker stuff in the Bible. And I'm telling you, that's where the real gold is in the Bible. There's some nuggets laying along the surface that you can grab even if you're just brand new in the Word of God. But, but when you start digging and mining down into it for yourself, that's where you find the real treasure. It's, it's, it's wonderful. And so I want to give you uh, the ability to study the Bible for yourself and, and to learn the basic rules of interpretation. Why don't we turn to this, uh, this verse here. Uh, go forward to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. Have you ever uh, talked with somebody about, oh, a Bible issue or something that uh, is controversial, and then they just slap you with, well, that's just your interpretation. Yeah. Oh, that's just, that's just how you guys interpret that. But everybody kind of interprets it differently, and what it means to me might not be what it means to you. No, no, no. There's one interpretation. Look at 2 Peter 1.20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. So there is not one meaning for you and another meaning for me and another meaning for somebody else. No, there are rules where we can come to the interpretation of the text. 
this is what it means, all right? And we can be confident about that. And we're gonna give you some of those rules of interpretation. Um, also to be equipped with various study tools and methods. Again, just kind of show you how to teach it, or how to study. Uh, and I'll let you in on some of my, uh, my cheating uh, tools and methods and things like that where, where some references that I gravitate towards and that I can look up at words and where I find all the stuff that I find, I wanna give all that to you. I wanna give you the tools so that you can study it on your own. I want you to fifthly become familiar with the order and structure of the Bible. This will, this will dovetail with our Sunday evening series. Now remember, we're all about God's Word changes lives. And so this year, this is the year of learning God's Word and getting comfortable with God's Word. And so we're going to learn the structure, uh, the, the, the order and all of it of the Bible. And that's why I want you to turn into different passages of Scripture and stuff. Um, keep your place. No, you don't have to keep your place here. We're going, to, going on. But go to the very beginning of your Bible where it has the table of contents. Okay, did you find it? It'd be before page one. So it has the name and order of all the books of the Bible. I want you to start learning this list. Okay, and maybe you've learned it before, and this is just going to be a review for you. Great, wonderful. But we're going to learn as a as a Sunday school project. We're going to learn the books of the Bible. All right. I think they're doing it upstairs. The kiddos have a head start on us. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but we, we ought to, right? You've been saved. You ought to be one that is capable of teaching to others. It, and, and this is a part of it, knowing your Bible, knowing the structure of it, and so on. And so say with me just the first five. Start real easy this morning. Ready? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Again, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Okay, now look up. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. One more time. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Okay, great. You got a good start. That's five down, 61 to go. <laughs> and it'll, it'll come and eventually it'll just flow and you'll be able to go through it almost like you can go through the alphabet A, B, C, D, E, F, G you know, and you'll just have that, that list where you can file it down and when you end up in one book you're like oh no it's behind that you know, or no and it's forward and you'll, you'll get comfortable with that until you are feel free to bookmark that table of contents and, and learn, to, learn to get there okay um, turn to the book of Job Book of Job, chapter 23. Oh, I've skipped verse or number six. To be able to confidently handle the word of God. Confidently handle the word of God. And that's that same passage of scripture that, that we should not be unskillful in the word. Number seven, to gain a love and a hunger for God's Word. This is really what it's all about. I don't want to just fill up your head with a bunch of information and teaching tools. I want you to become so acquainted with the Bible, and as you get more and more familiar with the Word, to fall in love with the Word. And that's how it works. That's how relationships always work. You know, When, when two people like each other, what do they want to do? They want to spend time with each other. And they want to get to know one another. And the more they get to know one another, the more they fall in love with one another. And that's, that's why communication is important in a marriage, to keep getting to know one another. The Bible says dwell with them according to knowledge. That's, a, that's important in the relationship, and it's important in the Word of God. And the more you're in it, the more you'll enjoy it. You'll, you'll come to acquire more and more of an appetite for it. Look at Job 23, verse 12. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Now, I esteem my necessary food quite highly, don't you? <laughs> my necessary food every day, you know, if I don't get it, 
there are consequences. There are ramifications of that. You know, I, I get into a mood if I if I don't uh, have my necessary food there. But Job, Job said, you know what? Before any of that, I crave God's words. I need it. I, I must have His word. That's all. That's a serious love and a hunger for the word. And I want every one of you to know that hunger. I want to develop myself in that hunger. So. Let's move on to the next page here. Did anybody miss any blanks? Or you got it. Okay. If not, get with me after. That's fine. All right. So big question here. Why not just leave Bible study to the experts? You know, I mean, you have been trained in this. So why don't you just tell us what to believe, Pastor? You've been trained. You went to school for this for four years on how to handle the Bible. Uh, why don't you just handle that, okay? Just like I leave, you know, my, my 401k and, and all the trading and stuff, I leave that to the experts. When I need my car fix, I bring it to the experts, right? Why, why do I have to do this myself? Why can't you do this, Pastor? Well, first, there are no Bible experts. There are only Bible students. Nobody knows everything there is to know about the Bible. The Bible is infinite. As deep as you go into it, you'll still be learning. I believe that when we get to heaven, and we've been there for a million years, we'll still be learning about the Word of God. That, that's how deep and how rich and how perfect and infinite it is. Look at uh, Psalm 119. I want to show you a few verses out of Psalm 119. David wrote much scripture. David had a love for the Word of God but David never claimed to be an expert. His prayer continually through the Psalms was teach me. Teach me, Lord. Teach me about your word. Look at uh, Psalm 119, verse 12. Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. Look at verse 26. I have declared my ways and thou heardest me. Teach me thy statutes. Another word for the Bible for God's word, for his laws. Uh, verse 33, teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes, and I shall keep it unto the end. Verse 64, the earth, O Lord, is full of thy mercy. Teach me thy statutes. Verse 66, teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I have believed thy commandments. Verse 68, thou art good and doest good. Teach me thy statutes. All the way over to 108. Except I beseech thee the free will offerings of my mouth, O Lord, and teach me thy judgments. And there are a couple others listed there, but that's just one chapter. That's one chapter where David just over and over again is saying, Lord, teach me, teach me, teach me. And that's how we all ought to be. And after I have been studying the Bible and preaching for 30, 40 years, when, I, when, I, when I'm an old man on my deathbed and I've been in the ministry my whole life, I still ought to have the attitude, teach me. Teach me. You never become a Bible expert. You're just a Bible student your whole life. So there's David. There's the Lord Jesus Christ. It says in Matthew 7, 29, that they were astonished because he taught them as one having authority. He could, he could teach and preach the word of God with authority because he is the word of God. He wrote it. And so he's the only what we would call authority on the scriptures. Anyone who represents themselves as an expert or Bible authority does not have the right kind of humility before God's word. Would you turn with me to Isaiah 66? Isaiah 66, verse 2. I'll read verse 1 just because it's powerful. Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne. And the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things hath mine hand made. And all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look. Even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembleth at my word. There ought to be a healthy fear and humility before the word of God. That anybody that comes up and says, da, 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 this is what this is, and I know all about these things, and, and there's nothing wrong if you've done the study to teach it in a, in a confident manner. But somebody that just does not fear it, that they have 
conquered it almost that they they have figured it all out and it's all it's all in their head they've ceased to be a student of the word they've ceased to be humble and to tremble before the word of god make sense mm -hmm. secondly you are in this spiritual battle you are in here it, it is not just the pastors and the missionaries who are out there on the front lines it's not like okay you pastor you go fight all those spiritual battles We'll cheer you on. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll pay you so you can go fight in that spiritual war. No, you're in it. Like it or not, folks. You are on the front lines. You will be attacked. The devil has a target not just on my back, but on your back. And you have to know how to fight in this spiritual war. You have to take the whole armor of God. You have to take the sword of the Spirit and be prepared to fight in this battle. Turn to 1 Peter 5. And that means I just can't, I can't do it for you. I've got my own battle to fight. And you have yours. 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. He wants to pick you off. He wants to take you out. And you have to have the armor and the sword to be able to fight in this battle. Thirdly, all believers have equal access to God and to God's word. Turn back to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 5. You know, unfortunately, somewhere along the line, People got into their heads that, that religiously there were these two categories. There were the clergy, the men of the cloth, and then there were the laity, or all the common people. And that the clergy had this special relationship and special access to God. And so it became almost like a priesthood. And so if you get into the Catholic Church and so on, there's these priests. And if you want to confess your sins to God, you can't go straight to God. You've got to go through a priest in order to confess to God. But in the Bible, it teaches that, that Christ is our only mediator, that we don't we don't have other priests. If you're saved, you are a priest. You have access to him. Romans 5, 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Yeah, and there's a whole lot like in the book of Hebrews about how that we can boldly come to the throne. So I don't have any corner on the Bible that you don't have. I don't have any special access or knowledge that, that God has given to me that you can't have for yourself. Turn to chapter 10. God has made his word available to everyone. Romans 10 verse 6. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. So he's saying you don't have to go up into the reaches of heaven to find out what God wants. You don't have to descend into the lower parts of the earth to discern the will of God and to find God's word. No, he says, it's available to you. It's near. It's nigh. It's, it's in your heart. It's, it's in your mouth. It's, it's, in your, it's sitting in your lap today. You have access to God's word just as much as anybody else. Fourthly, here's a big one. You need to be able to identify false teaching. You do. Don't leave that up to me. Don't leave that up to anybody to be able to identify false teaching. Look at Acts um, 17. Acts 17, 10. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night into Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind 
and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. What a neat thing. And they're commended for that. That they received it willingly. So they sat and listened under the apostles' teaching. And they're like, wow, this is good. Uh, it, it seems like they were taking notes and they're, they're figuring out what this is all about. And then they went home and searched the scriptures daily. They did their own personal Bible study to see whether these things were so. Does this line up scripturally? And the Bible calls them noble. That was, it was very noble of them. It was very good of them to take the word that the apostles were giving and then go back and search the scriptures daily to see whether it was so. It's very important that, that you, you need to know for yourself. You need to know what you believe and why. Churches for a long time have, Baptist churches have done a great job of teaching you what to believe, teaching you what is right. You know, I grew up and, and I knew doctrine, okay? My pastor was a teacher and, and it, was, it was a lot of doc, good doctrinal stuff. Uh, but, but sometimes Baptist churches have not done a great job at teaching why we believe what we believe. And that's important, especially in this day and age. It's, it's not like you can just come to church and that's the authority anymore. No, people are questioning everything. Every, you need to know the why behind what you believe. And this is the why. Okay, you need to know the verses, the scriptures that, that back up everything that we believe. And, and if you're intimidated by that, hey, it's a, it's a process. It'll come in time. You don't have to know it all today, but you should have a heart that says, I want to know what I believe, and I want to know why I believe it, so I can stand there. And that's, that's biblical. Fifthly, you need to be able to identify false teachers. Did you realize not everyone who claims to speak the truth actually does? <laughs> and how, who's going to tell you which one's right? Am, am I get supposed to tell you that? Well, partly. But you need to know from the Bible what lines up and what doesn't. And if somebody is teaching something that doesn't line up with Scripture, you need to have the discernment in your own mind that you say, no, that's a false teacher. Because that, that doctrine, that teaching that they are promoting does not line up with the word. And so then you avoid that. And you, you walk away from that and say, no, I don't want that false teaching to be a part of my life. So don't put your faith in any man, but in the word of God. And that, that includes me, folks. Your faith does not rest upon your pastor. I hope you can trust me in some ways, but you don't take my word uh, at face value. You go search it out for yourself. You're responsible for that. To know, to discern from Scripture whether I am teaching truth or not. Also, you need to be able to feed yourself rather than relying on someone else for your spiritual growth. It's one thing for a baby to be reliant upon its parents for food. But when, it, when you become an adult, you probably ought to figure out how to feed yourself. You, you need to know how to do that. And, and if all, all the Bible that you're getting is Sunday morning when you show up at church, you're not getting fed enough. You need to be eating throughout the week. You need to be feeding on the Scripture. Make it more, than, more necessary than your, your daily food. And uh, don't, don't rely on anybody else for your spiritual growth. What if something happens and persecution comes and we can't have church like this? Or you get taken away somewhere. How are you going to grow? You need to know how to feed yourself. I think of Daniel a lot of times. Pulled away from his home. No more synagogue. No more church. No more teachers. No more anything. But he grew. And he fed on the Word of God. He learned it on his own. He, he stayed strong even in that situation. Seventh, Scripture is profitable and necessary in your life. You need it. Eight, you are individually accountable to God. Look at Romans 8. Romans 14. Romans 14. And verse 12 it says, So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. So you have access to God's word. And therefore the Lord expects you to know it. He expects you to believe it. He expects you to live by it. You, you can't, it, it won't be on the day of reckoning that God comes to you and says, you, your whole life you believe this. And, and 
why did you believe this error? My, my word was pretty clear on it. Well, so-and-so taught me wrong. Yeah, but my word was clear on it. You should have known better. You will give account for yourself. You can't point the fingers on that day. And you can't say, oh, this person taught me that, or I heard it there. No. God, God says, you have my word. You need to be able to know what you believe and why. So that you can stand before God one day and say, this is why I believe. Point to scripture. Kind of an intimidating thought, isn't it? That you will stand and give account for that. And uh, you need to know how to use the sword. And I'm here to help you. Help train you. And I... Some of it will be very simple. Hopefully it will be very practical solutions. But you need to know how to use the sword, how to properly handle the Word of God. I'm looking forward to this uh, study. Hope it will be a help to you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time together. Uh, Father, I pray that you would help us.